Hi, Booktube, and welcome to my first video of 2023, which will be a recent read for the books I've read in January uh, so far, which comprise five. Ann Carson's Knox, Yelena Moscovich's Virtuoso, uh, a short story collection. Yes, Mark Nash reads a short story collection, Variations on the Body by Colombian author Maria Ospina, and this is translated by Heather Cleary. Uh, Individu ah, let me get the title of this right. Individuotopia, Individuotopia by Josh Sheldon. And finally, The Voids by uh, Scottish writer Ryan O'Connor. So I'm going to start with uh, Anne Carson, which is a my second book in a box. So there's the box. You take out the book put the box down and it's like a concertina design um, <laughs> it's somewhat unworldly to do this in front of a camera it's a lot easier to do when you're reading but you can see all the pages are concertina together and I know this is the first week of January but I can, can confidently predict this will finish in my top 10 reads of 2023. So, as a, you know, I've read three other Anne Carson books. I was originally made aware of this by Travel Through Stories, for which thank you. And uh, the her other, I mean, Anne Carson is a very eclectic writer within each of her writing projects in terms of styles, genre, mixing things like poetry and documentary style and sort of film and all this sort of stuff. So in her other books, while I've appreciated them all, there are bits of them that haven't worked. There are bits of them that I haven't been able to fit into the whole. Here, it seemed to me that all of her techniques come together beautifully and seamlessly. It's a book about uh, the death of her brother and trying to piece that together, being as, uh, while she has lots of memories of when they were children growing up together, he left home in rather strange circumstances, probably on the run from the law, and was very much out of touch with his family. They didn't really know where he was. Uh, and his mother got one letter from him, uh, which she preserved amongst all her letters. Uh, when she was on her deathbed, she got rid of them all except this one letter from her son. Um, so it's a very sort of fractured uh, record, fragmentary um, sort of documentary evidence that um, Carson is drawing on to try and recreate her brother once she's found out that he has died in Denmark. He was married twice. Another woman was the love of his life. But she didn't really know any of this until she started trying to, re, you know, sort of put together a picture of him. And what the book does so brilliantly is this fragmentary nature of, of evidence she starts off sort of talking about the earliest historians uh, in mankind's history, uh, a, a Roman and uh, or Greek, I can't remember, but then Herodotus. And she, she quotes an example from Herodotus of uh, when um, the ruler of a kingdom was asked what the population of that kingdom was, the ruler said, uh, we have this bowl and every citizen is required to surrender one arrowhead into the bowl, which is melted down. And that represents all our citizens, not only the ones who are still living, but the ones who've, who have lived and died because their arrowheads will be in there. So um, he was then asked, OK, well, how many are in there? He says, oh, we don't know. But what we do know is that every single citizen is accounted for amongst in this bowl. And all Herodotus, all Herodotus could do by way of reporting and recording that is he describes the bowl. And Carson is saying, you know, this, you know, history itself is, frank, you know, the, the, the documentary and evidential record is already patchy because it's had to survive X hundreds of years. But even within that, it's a partial record because cultural differences, linguistic differences. Herodotus describes the bowl, can't answer the question of how many citizens there were of this. Another thing she used, so having set up the, the sort of the, the, the history element, uh, virtually on every left-hand page is uh, it's like a dictionary. Uh, it's a Latin dictionary, mainly of prepositions and nouns. And the reason she provides this... I want to explain about the Catullus poem 101. 
Catullus poem 101 for his brother, who died on the trode. Nothing at all is known of the brother except his death. Catullus appears to have travelled from Verona to Asia Minor to stand at the grave. Perhaps he recited his elegy there. I have loved this poem since the first time I read it in high school, Latin class, and I have tried to translate it a number of times. Nothing in English can come close to capture the passionate slow surface of a Roman elegy. No one, even in Latin, can approximate Catullan diction, which at its most sorrowful has an air of deep festivity, like one of those trees that turns all its leaves over, silver in the wind. I never arrived at the translation I would have liked to of Poem 101, but over the years of working at it, I came to think of translating as a room, not exactly an unknown room, where one gropes for the light switch, I guess it never ends. A brother never ends. I prowl him. He does not end. Prowling the meaning of a word, prowling the history of a person, no use expecting a flood of light. Human words have no main switch, but all those little kidnaps in the dark, and then the luminous, big, shivering, discanded, unrepentant, banking, barking web of them that hangs in your mind when you turn back to the page you were trying to translate. What if you made a collection of lexical entries as someone who is asked to come up with a number for the population of the Scythians might point to the bowl? So what she's saying is words are really, you know, not in the same way as history can't ever deliver a perfect record. Words can't. Words are only ever sort of fragmentary uh, sort of glimpses into meaning themselves. And that's why she provides a dictionary of these Latin terms to say mainly prepositions. But what's fascinating in these, in these sort of etymological entries is how the meanings can be changed just by the addition of a preposition, a pronoun, that they become idiomatic. And it's a very fluid, flexible, fragmentary thing. Sometimes, you know, the same thing, it can mean the opposite. The same word, but has two opposite meanings, contronyms. And what's interesting is that every time the word nox, which in Latin means night or dark, that really turns the thing on its head. So nox makes an appearance in a lot of these etymological uh, entries. So it's just a brilliant fragmentary uh, meditation on loss of bereavement of uh, a brother that she hardly knew. And it's also a, a, an investigation into knowledge and words and meaning and all, and all this sort of stuff. And, I, and it brings together, say, a lot of the elements of Carson's other books, such as her interest in etymology, her classical reading and learning, and, and just brings it together so beautifully. It looks thick, but because it's concertinaed and the inside pages are, are blank, uh, it's actually quite a quick read. So five stars, wonderful. And on to Virtuosa, Yelena Moscovich. So last year I read uh, her latest novel called The Door Behind the Door, which is my first Moscovich, and had no idea what to make of it, but I loved it. I loved its propulsiveness. I can't remember being pushed through sort of page turning of novel as sort of rapidly as, as that was. And it made my top reads of the year, even though I didn't understand sort of what the plot was and what it was saying. It didn't matter. So I was intrigued to find an earlier work of hers to see if it was similar. And this is not propulsive in the way that was in terms of the sort of short staccato verse of text, but it's very much, it's it's queer writing, not only in its subject matter of the characters, of which I'll, I'll say in a minute, but just the nature that no, nobody ha is privileged here. Everybody is on an equal footing. It's very democratic in that way. And what the plot is, it's sort of the story of, it starts with um, some CPR on someone who's, who, you know, tried to revive them, which is very propulsive. And uh, that person is Dominique, who was one half of a lesbian couple. And she dies. She's actually committed suicide. It's not a spoiler, it happens at the start of the novel. Uh, and her then partner, who's 20 years younger than her, Amy, uh, meets uh, and, and very, very tentatively starts another uh, lesbian relationship with a, a, a Czech emigre called Jana. Jana had, uh, uh, when she was growing up under communism in, in Czech Republic, or wasn't called, in Czechoslovakia as well, um, she had a friend called Zorka, who always thought she was going to flee their, their surroundings because it was so terrible. 
Um, so we so we get the story of all these different women as they circle around each other, not only sort of spatially on different continents and different countries, but emotionally how they circle together, uh, circle around each other before they finally come together, where Yana and Amy are together, and we see what's happened to Zorka. And I just thought it was beautifully done. Again, it is quite propulsive, not to the, d the degree of the door behind the door, but it really sweeps you along, carries you along, um, and I just think it's it's really, really well done. Five stars. And on to a collection of short stories, which, as I said in my introduction, I haven't really read, picked up a collection of short stories voluntarily for several years now. But I saw a book blogger talk about this and uh, I am interested in all things uh, Colombian. And interestingly for me, the first story of this uh, is about uh, a former member of the FARC guerrillas who... Uh, left uh, the civilised cities to go and wage war based uh, for the jungle. And it's about her sort of re-entry into civilization with under a government scheme to uh, re-acclimatise and help former terrorists and drug dealers and uh, right-wing paramilitarists sort of reintegrate with society, providing them with, with jobs and housing, that sort of stuff, which has echoes in part of my novel uh, Three Dreams in the Key of G which is about what happens to the paramilitaries in post-peace agreement Northern Ireland. That's what really reached out to me um, and it's brilliant. It's a brilliant story. She gets a job uh, on the cash till of a supermarket so it's all about, you know, she's a former Marxist in, in FARC was heavily propagandised and now here she is in this sort of shrine to capitalism and the free market she is in the midst of selling uh, her story to be published into a book. So there are meetings with her editors here in which her words are very much sort of moulded and struck out. And the way, I don't know if you can see this, but the way it is, you get the um, editor's sort of strikeouts of her text, which is sort of denying her her, her own story. She's quite colloquial and they've made it much more sort of formalised literary language. There's sort of political tweaking and almost censorship here. It's, it's just brilliantly done. So um, at dawn, I continued on my journey, crossed out into my escapes. So already it's been sort of sensationalised. I saw that a large animal had been killed by one of the mines. It looked like a jaguar, but I couldn't say for sure, crossed out, because no, we must have in the world of sort of post-tabloid journalism, we must have certainty. Um, by then it was just meat, and that's crossed out, and the editor has put carrion. Again, the formal, more formal literary language. It made me so sad, so angry with myself, because what did he have to do with the war? I even thought about staying to bury him, but that would have been irresponsible, and so I kept going. All of that is struck out by the editor. The path brought me to a big, beautiful lake that I recognised, because we'd passed it a few weeks earlier, and I remembered thinking how pretty it was. I remember thinking how pretty it was, struck out because this is not about her personal recollections, her sort of fancies and fantasies, her likes, her aesthetic sense. They're not interested in that. They want the hard and fast sort of story of the war, not, not one's subjective impressions. I needed to help carry the prisoner in my care, struck out, person we'd kidnapped. So again, a political, you know, it's now become a kidnap. It's criminal, not military and political. So I just thought that story was terrific. Then the next story was um, her sister, Zanada, who is uh, a nanny stroke housemaid in this rich family. And she has just been made pregnant by her boyfriend. And um, there's a tension between that because she knows that it's very likely to lead to her being fired from the house and the ministration she gives to the the daughter who lives in the house the young child who she's very very good with she's very very naturally gifted at entertaining this curious slightly precocious girl who's asking all these questions she's really really good at it but morally she stepped beyond the bounds because she's having a child out of wedlock so her body's been pulled in two ways one is her life as an adult i.e starting a family of her own but also these childlike inquiries, this sort of continually tugging at her elbow with these questions as the child is looking to grow from the child through into the adult stage. So her body is being pulled two ways. 
And then we come to Saving Young Ladies, third story, which is about a woman who has returned to Bogota in Colombia to kind of re sort of stabilise herself. She's a writer. She needs to get back to editing a manuscript. And she, the apartment she has is opposite a, a Catholic girls' school. She sees the nun. She sees the students. And she sort of makes contact uh, with one of the students as if this student wants saving, wants breaking out of this 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 school. And in a way, she sort of becomes the the grown up becomes like a stalker. It's quite creepy, you know. Sort of there are things about sort of you know echoes of paedophilia, even though she's not she's not really doing anything other than watching her um, but she's sort of stalking her from the comfort of her own bedroom and she's sort of having these fantasies of how she's going to save her it's quite a religiously tinged text and and the uh, the translator Heather Clary points to a poem that resonates this story resonates and bounces off and in the end actually quotes a little bit of the religious text but you don't need to know you don't need to be familiar with that and they do make contact they do form a relationship and she does think she's going to bust her out she says you can come here any time you if you want to leave that school you can stay with me for a while until you set yourself up etc etc and then it all goes a bit a bit wrong for her um but she then she just redraws her sights and then decides that she's going to help save a dog um that the human thing that saving a human being is too difficult too tricky too many things to take into consideration too many emotional things firing around so she's going to save a dumb animal very very clever story and then there are three other stories all of them I think highly entertaining except maybe the last one I was a bit left cold by that there's another one about a woman who's perpetually bitten by fleas and all the um, um, precautions she takes to sort of basically wage war on these fleas I think it's a an allegory for the the, the war the civil war within Colombia but there's also the notion of you know, one of the bits is she she makes she takes um, notes on you know the course of a a month as to you know how many bites, where the bites, how badly they itch, all this sort of stuff, and it has echoes of a, a woman keeping a record of her own pregnancy. Uh, it's just very very clever, very very subversive. This is what I find the whole time that that, that she does. And then, uh, apart, I'm not talking about the last story, but the penultimate story is um, one about uh, a woman who inherits from her parents uh, a doll uh, sort of repair service, mainly dedicated to antique dolls. Um, and it's, again, it's sort of comparing or, or bringing together the notion of mending dolls with plastic surgery for women uh, and restoring beauty in dolls. They've been, you know, cracked or whatever and this notion of beauty of actually change you know not restoring to what the doll looked like originally but actually changing one's body so i just thought this was a terrific collection five stars and onto individutopia by joss sheldon so this is about a um dystopian london in the near future and it's been rendered dystopian by uh, mrs thatcher's infamous seven word statement that there is no such thing as society and what's interesting about the way this dystopia has come about is yes sort of the rich get richer off the backs of everybody else and there are oligarchs and stuff but in a way it's almost a voluntary um, enlisting in the project by the people who 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 participate in the market by consumers um, and there's lots of nods to sort of technology how um, your popularity in various categories are measured how much money you you're working to pay off what your debt is um, you have to apply for for jobs all the time so it's very much a technological or an internet online based living the work though is completely useless it's sisyphean labors it's it's not for a purpose because everything's met, uh, automated the people don't know this, you know, they go to work expressly to reduce the level of their debt by the money they earn. Um, they, do, they never think for one moment that the work is meaningless. Um, there are no trade unions, there's no collective activity. No, you know, people don't even look at each other. They project avatars of themselves out on the streets. So they don't have to interact with any other real human beings. And the story starts with what is presumed to be the last born 
uh, child in London has grown up. She's the last born child because people don't interact, which means they don't have relationships, they don't have sex even. She was the last one to squeeze through, you know, before that sort of the, the portcullis came down on that. And her mother abandoned her at birth because in this sort of drive to individualism, the mother felt the child was responsible for bringing herself up. And she was brought up by a sort of a baby room robot. So she's had no human interaction. You know, she's labouring under all these illusions that she doesn't, that she's picked up off the internet, basically, which are things like um, strap lines and hucksterisms and, and all this. sort. Of, you know, so her self um, exhortations are drawn from, you know, just do it like the Nike line and, and, and things like things like that. But gradually she's throwing off. Um, she's throwing off this sort of, you know, she begins to question it without having the, the language or the conceptual apparatus to know exactly how she's she's doing it. So in that way, it's a bit Brave New World. It's a bit 1984. It's a bit um, Nicola Barker's Happy, if you've read any of those. Some of the satire is spot on. Some of the sort of, you know, just looking ahead into the future is how something in our current times is going to turn out, you know, sort of take it to the nth degree. Some, some of that really works. Some of it misses by a country mile. And once she throws off um, the yoke of, of this sort of artificial world, also like the, you know, the matrix in the white room part of it, you know, throwing off the, the um, generated image of, of what existence is, it loses some of its sharpness, I feel. It, it gets a bit bucolic, it gets a bit cliched, and the ending is ridiculous. I mean, just full of schmaltz. But I think there are enough interesting ideas here to, to make it worthwhile. Three stars. And finally, onto the voids. So you've heard the term caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. I would say caveat lector, let the reader beware. This is sort of touted as uh, a book about... Um, Four um, high-rise tenement bu buildings in Glasgow are due for demolishing for urban renewal. A few people won't give up their, their flats in, in one of the blocks. They won't accept the payments for relocation. They're hanging on for grim death. Now, that's very much in the um, wheelhouse of J.G. Ballard or the Chinese version Little Gods by Meng Jin is a similar idea. And that's, you know, I think worth exploring about sort of urban renewal and, and, and sort of clinging on in the, in the face of that and the changing nature of cities and stuff. But it isn't. I mean, that's in there. And at the end, we get to a return to the spatial aspect of, of the tower block. But in between, this is just, um, it's just another book about a Glaswegian ad addict, both alcoholic and drug fueled. And, you know, I've read James Kelman's books uh, in the 80s or 90s, whenever they came out. Uh, I refuse to read Eleanor Oliphant is, uh, is whatever, uh, because I'm not interested in alcoholics. I haven't read Shuggy Bain for the same reason, because it's uh, one of the parents is an alcoholic. But the difference I suspect between Shuggy Bain and this is Shuggy Bain has heart and warmth. This has none of that. We just get one journey to another journey. He's determined to just see where, you know, where each event leads. He's not interested in laying down any kind of roots or laying down any kind of understanding or accumulating anything. He just want, he's like a pinball bouncing off each barrier and lighting it up. And it gets very, very boring. It also presents, you know, Glasgow is not helping itself by churning out authors who keep repeating this image of Glasgow as a city full of drunks and heroin addicts. They're there. I'm not denying that they're there. But must all of its literature sort of uh, monolithically deal with this? Um, the, the point about um, writing about alcoholic adventures without it sort of expanding into any other kind of insight is we, the reader, are sober throughout all of this. And it becomes very boring in the way as when someone's retelling you their drinking stories and the outrageous things that happened to them. If you weren't there, it's boring. And this is boring, even though, you know, there's some surreal things, there are unexpected things, there's bits of humanity, there's bits of human predation. It's just very squalid, very nasty, lots of 
throwing up, lots of being, you know, losing all your clothes, losing your money. I really didn't like this at all. Two stars. And there you have it. That was my first uh, reading wrap up for 2023. Um, till next time. Thank you.